Hey, let's take a look at this bellringer here. It says if cotangent, and I know it's alpha, I'm going to say A. If cotangent A is beta 7 over 24 and located quadrant 2 and secant, again, I know it's beta, but I'm going to say B, is 5 thirds and located quadrant 4, find sine alpha plus beta, A sine A plus B. Okay, let's start with this. Let's, let's just give a quick drawing. Quadrant 2. If I were to draw quadrant 2, is that... Top right, bottom left, top right, top left, bottom right, bottom left. Where's quadrant two? Top left. Top left. Okay, so my drawings, I want to draw it kind of like this to make it easier. And I'm going to put a triangle. Anytime you draw a triangle, I recommend always doing it standard position. You'll learn in chapter eight, nine, because it has huge shortcuts. So standard position is when it connects to which axis? x-axis. So let's connect our triangles to the x-axis. Like so. Now they gave us two sides of this triangle. And they did so by telling us cotangent's value. Sine is y, cosine is x, tangent is y over x. What you think about cotangent? If you don't know, you it's up there on your cheat sheet, you can look at it. Cotangent is 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1 x over y. The purpose for the drawing is to indicate which value is negative. With our drawing, is the x value the negative or is the y value the negative? x. y is going to be a positive 24. x is negative 7. We're missing h. How can we find h? The Pythagorean theorem. So x squared plus y squared equals h squared. We plug in our numbers. Uh, the, ne the negative 7, I want to put parentheses just in case you're a calculator user. If you don't put that in parentheses, calculator follows PEMDAS and will square the 7, then do the, the negative. That's not right. You want it to be negative 7 times a negative 7. If you think about mental math, what that is, or calculator, be typing that in, and that will equal 24. Oh, I messed up. Someone correct me. How did I mess up? I put 24 in place of the hypotenuse. That's not where that goes. 24 is the y. Okay, so I corrected it. So negative 7 times negative 7 is not negative 49. Grab the parentheses. Positive 49. There you go. Positive 49. 24 times 24? 576. Good. And so we need to add those together to get our hypotenuse square. Oh, you already did. 625. 625 is our h squared. So now the last step, what is the opposite of a square? Square root. Square root. Typically, I'd say it comes with a positive or negative. This time, we don't have to because we know, based off of what quadrant and what variable, that this has to be h is, h is always positive h is going to be the positive of that square root. What is the positive? What is the square root of 625? 25. Now I'm going to pause that triangle. We'll come back to it. I'm going to call this triangle A. We put the A there. And now we're going to take a look at triangle B. So triangle B, they tell me that's in quadrant four. What quadrant? Top right, top left, bottom right, bottom left. Where's quadrant four? Bottom right. Bottom right. So I'm going to draw it this way this time. And again, whenever you draw a triangle in standard position, which axis should it always connect to? X axis. They describe to us sine lengths for this triangle, each saying secant is 5 thirds. Sine is y, cosine is x, tangent is y over x. Secant would then be 5. Four, three, two, one. H divided by X. Good. This is triangle B. Do not forget that. That B there. So it would be H is five, and X is three. We could do Pythagorean. My guess is some of you know. Whenever you have a triangle that's right, and it's a three blank five triangle, three blank five. What's the blank number? Three, four, five. This one's going down though. So we actually going to list it as 
y equals four? Negative. Negative four. Now, if you don't know a three, four, five triangle, how could you get that leg length again? We could do Pythagorean theorem again, but we'll just say that's a Pythagorean triple, a three, four, five that we've seen so many times. Okay, so what can we do with all that? Now that we have these two triangles solved, we can actually solve the problem. If you were not here last class, we talked about, well, you can take, you can find the sines, cosines, and tangents of angles either being added or subtracted from one another using a formula in the formula chart. They asked us to find sine A plus B. So what we're going to do is go to our formula chart, and I'm going to pull the formula for sine A plus B. <clears throat> so look for sine A plus B. Where is it? Oh, it's down towards the bottom of my, my screen. Right here, sine A plus B. That's the formula we're going to pull right here. Just copy and paste this here. That's my formula I'm using. And now this is way too large. So it says sine A plus B would equal all these values. Sorry, it got so stretched, but we'll, we'll figure it out. So if sine A plus B equals all that, then we can say sine A plus B will be, well, you take the sine of A. So you look at triangle A and sine, Let's think of our ratio, sines y, cosines x, tangent is y over x. What is sines ratio? Three, two, one. Y divided by h. So in this case, it'll be 24 divided by 25. Now this needs to multiply times the cosine of triangle B. So now we look at this triangle. Now, what is cosine's ratio? Five, four, three, two, one. X over H, which would become three-fifths. Plus cosine triangle A. Let me extend this a little bit, make it easier for you to see this. Cosine of triangle A, five, four, three, two, one. It's X over H, so negative seven over 25. And this would multiply with sine of B. This form, uh, sine of this triangle right here. Sine is Y over H, so five, four, three, two, one. There we go. As you go to simplify this, you might notice something about the two denominators. What do you notice about these two denominators? They're the same. So we can combine it into one fraction. Mental math here. Do you all know what 25 times 5 is? 125. That's going to be our denominator. I have 24 times 3. 24 times 3 would be 72. Good. Plus, this will be a negative times a negative. What happens with a negative times a negative? They will go positive. So it still will stay a plus. 7 times 4 is 28. So 72 plus 28 is 100. So we have 100 divided by 125. And that can simplify. 25 goes into both those numbers. 25 goes into 100 four times. And 25 goes into 125 five times. And so that would be our answer there. So that right there was a review of these two triangles would be like lessons four one. When we first came back from Christmas break, I told you, I taught you a few things specifically. That one, when you solve the triangle, we're always going to connect it to which axis and pre job X axis. That's called standard position. I taught you that. Number two, I taught, I reminded you of geometry that Pythagorean theorem, it's a right triangle, x squared plus y squared will equal h squared. And third, I taught you that first day that h is always positive. Those are some of the rules I gave you. So the top part of my screen here would be lesson four one. At the bottom was what we did last class. Is you can take sine or cosine of multiple angles added together. And what I did is I just kind of made it tricky. And that the two angles you're adding up were not like a 30 degrees and 45 degrees, which was what we spent most of the time last class doing. What I did that was different 
is instead of the angle, I, I showed you the triangle. If I wanted to draw this perfectly correct, here's one thing I would need to change. Now that I've done the problem, I'll show you. I would actually not put the theta there. I would have put the A there. So it's saying sine of this triangle. And I wouldn't have put the theta there. I would have put the B right there. Now it's even a better drawing. That's technically how I should have drawn it to make all the math work perfectly. Okay, questions? All right, so today, what's our goal today? It's our, our goal is to review all of chapter four and chapter five. So I just showed you four one in lesson five four. We've gone over 11 lessons, by the way. So a lot of material to kind of review over here. Uh, so we're looking at trigonometric applications. So we're going to apply trigonometry and mathematical and real world problems. So the first one was just mathematical. I didn't have anything real world about it, but that's what we're going to see today. Okay, let's take a look at example number one here. It says, what is the exact value of tangent negative 14 pi over three if it exists? What are some ideas you have for how we could solve this? Uh, okay, this is le lesson five, four three. By the way, I hear add two pi. Why would should we add two pi? What's the problem with what you're looking at? This angle is that on the unit circle? Why not? What's wrong with it? It's too small because the negative. So we would add two pi. So what we're trying to do is get this on the unit circle. This is one way of solving this problem: is using our unit circle. Let's try to find the value of the unit circle. So we would add two pi. Um, just because I've done this a few times today, I'm gonna write negative 14 pi over three here. And instead of adding just straight up two pi, because I would have to get a common denominator. To get a common denominator to add two pi, the denominator needs to be three. I would have to multiply both numerator and denominator by three. What is three times two? Six pi. So it's negative 14 pi plus six pi's over three. The way fractions work is the denominator will not change, just the numerator. So it'll be negative when you add and subtract that is. It'll be negative 14 pi plus six pi. What is negative 14 pi plus six pi? Negative eight pi. Now, is that gonna be on the unit circle? What's wrong with that one? Still, Still too small. So what do we do now? Add another two pi, which is this time I'm just going to write it as six pi over three. If any of you are lost, what is six divided by three? Two. two. I'm adding two pi. I'm just doing it as a common denominator. <clears throat> so negative eight pi over three plus six pi over three. Again, will give me a pi over three. How many pi's if it's negative eight pi plus six pi? Negative two pi over three. Now, is that on the unit circle? What's the problem? Still too small. So we do this another time. And it'll only be one more time because this time we're going to turn positive. What's negative 2 pi over 3 plus 6 pi over 3? 4. 4 pi over 3. What we just found are coterminal values. And the reason you do that is because with trigonometric functions, they are periodic is the word. Periodic means their values repeat. So tangent of negative 14 pi over 3 will equal the tangent of four pi over three. They will be the exact same answer because they are periodic. Their values repeat over a certain period of time. Okay, so we go to our unit circle. I find four pi over three. Now sine is y, cosine is x, tangent is y over x. So once we find four pi over three, I'm going to take my values and divide my y over x. The twos will cancel each other out. You can ignore the twos. That's why we say just treat the twos like as if they were h's and ignore them because they cancel one another out. So really, you're taking this y and dividing it by this x. So our value should be negative square root of 3 divided by negative 1. Now tell me about this. What's a negative divided by a negative? Positive and square root of three divided by one is square root of three. Okay, switch gears with me. I want to talk to you about a second way you could do this. Could you use your calculator? Yes. With a pi, 
Pi means what type of mode? Radiance. Radiance. Because remember, pi, the number 3.14, where that comes from is on a circle. It's a count of radiuses to get around halfway around a circle. So if you took this radius length right here and you measured it, how many radiuses would it take to get from this point here, if this is your start, to this point here, if this is the end? How many radiuses would it take to get around the outside, the circumference of the circle? It would take 3.14, or we'd say pi radiuses. Well, well, that's not how we actually say it. We say radians, a very similar word, radians, radiuses. So radius always goes from the center to the outside. A radian is a radius length, but on the circumference or the perimeter, whatever word you want to use. So that's what a radian is. So anytime you see pi, you're always in radians because that's what's measuring, radiuses. With that, go to your calculator, type this in. I'm going to show you something cool. Type in tangent, negative 14 pi over 3. And if I press enter, I'm going to have a problem. I'm not in radians, am I? So I'm going to press enter, then change it. Otherwise, it'll delete it. And now I'll have to copy and press enter again. I'm getting 1.73205. Is that similar to your answer? Okay, something I want to point out here is we know what the exact answer should be. We know the answer should be square root of three. Is that correct? Now, if you're taking a multiple multiple choice test, you could play the matching game. You could type in answer choices and Lo and behold, would the square root of three generate the same decimal? Does that work if you're taking a test? Okay, but let's say you're not taking a test. What if you want to complete your Alex? You're going, hey, Alex doesn't give me multiple choice. I can't play the guess, the matching game. I can't just figure it out. Well, mathematically, here's how you do it. With pre-cal, in my class, there's two situations where you're going to see never any decimals. Okay, they're called irrational numbers. They come from two different things. One is working with pi. What's pi's number? Is it actually just 3.14? No, it's a never-ending number. So if you have a pi included, you'll have a never-ending answer. The other irrationals come from square roots. Now, I want you to put on your thinking cap for a second. We got this value by tangent of negative 14 pi over 3. We've already used our pi. So if you use your pi here, that means that's the angle. This is then side length, which doesn't include pi's. They're always with square roots. That means this is a square root. The way to trick your calculator to give you the answer is to do the opposite. What's the opposite of a square root? Uh, square. Okay, so come down here on your blank line. Just hit a square button. Hit the square. It'll say A and S. What does that mean? Answer. answer. If you press answer and then hit square, hit enter, what does it say? Three. So now we know that our answer was the square root of three. How do I know it's the square root? Because I just did the opposite. What's the opposite of the square root? Square, and it gave me the number three. Does that make sense? Can I show you that again with a different function now? Let's say, um, just for example, I wanted you to find the cosine. I'll write it down over here. This is extra, extra. Let's say I wanted you to find the cosine of negative 25, whoops, 25, pi divided by six. And I want it with no decimals, the way a lot of your Alex homeworks are written. If you did not want to do the coterminal stuff we did using the algebra, type it in, let's see what you get. So find your calculator, go to cosine, make sure you're in radians again, negative, 25 pi divided by 6. Press enter. If you get a crazy decimal, what does that mean? And you know it's not the angle. This is the side. We already typed the angle, so it's not the pi. What's the only other way to get a crazy decimal? A square root. So our calculator is giving us the square root value. What should we do to get rid of that square root value? Square it. Square it. Press enter. Get 
So that means it's the square root of 0. 0.75. Do y'all know what 0. 0.75 is as is a fraction? Okay, you did not know. You could always just go menu two, two. 0. 0.75, menu two, two. And it'll change to three fourths. So our answer has to be the square root of three fourths. The answer would be the square root of three fourths. Well, square roots you can reduce. It's a fraction. If you can reduce the numerator or the denominator, do so. Can you reduce the three? No, no that stays the square root three. Can we reduce the square root of four? What is the square root of four? Two. So the answer would be square root of three over two. Cool. All right. Your turn. DOL number one. What is the exact value of cosecant negative 13 pi over six? You can use whichever technique you prefer. All right, now comes problem number two. Now, problem number two is a blending of less than four one and four three together. It tells you this. If cosine is seven over 25, I wanna pause. Sine is y, cosine is x, tangent is y over x. When they say cosine is 7 over 25, they're telling you two things in particular. What are they telling you about 7 and 25? The x and the h, okay? And it says tangent is less than 0. That's also telling you something very important. What is that telling you if tangent is less than negative? If tangent is less than 0, it's telling you tangent is negative. It says, now, what is the value of cosecant? And so we have a little, we can use a acronym to figure out what quadrant this is in to draw a proper triangle and solve this. What's the acronym that we've used this school year to tell you what's positive and what's negative? All students take calculus. It's based off the idea that X's are positive to the right, so cosines would be positive. Y's are positive up high, so sines would be positive. And since X and Y are positive in the first quadrant, everything's positive there. Whereas only tangents positive in the third quadrant, because since it's uh, X divided by, or excuse me, Y divided by X, the negatives would cancel each other out. And so this cosine, now let's talk about cosine. If it's seven over 25, is cosine positive or negative? Positive. So the only two locations that cosine can be positive are where? Where the only two places cosine can be positive? A and C. First quadrant, fourth quadrant. It's one of those two. Tangent is negative. So by the way, since it, it can only be positive there, I should have eliminated. I should have eliminated the, the S and the T because the A and C are the only places cosine can be positive. Now, what about tangent? Tangent is negative. So which one could it not be in? A. Tangent would be positive there, whereas it would be negative there. So we're in the fourth quadrant. So now I'm going to draw my triangle. So it's kind of a similar problem to the bell ringer in this regard. Uh, every triangle that we draw should connect to which axis? The axis is called standard position that we talked about in lesson four one. And so here's that, right angle, there's my theta. We know the x is seven, that's why it's to the right. H is 25. The only thing left to solve is y. We already did this Pythagorean on the bell ringer. We had this triple. Do you wanna go back to the bell ringer and look at your answers to see what you, what you got? We had this Pythagorean triple. We found out it was a 7, 24. It's going to be a 7, 24. You fill in the numbers, you got a 49 here and a 625 there. You subtract, we get 576. Again, this is all in the bell ringer. You want to just go backwards. So y squared would equal 576. I want the opposite of a square, square root. So there's the math. 
Now, but anytime you add a square root, you should add a plus or minus, but this time we don't have to because we know something about y. Since this is in quadrant four, what's gotta be true about y? It's negative. It's negative. So this is the negative of square root 576, which is negative 24. So now you can find your answer. You're, we're solving for C, S, C, cosecant. So I want you to think cosecant. Sines y, cosines x, tangent is y over x. What would cosecant be? Five, four, three, two, one. H over y. So 25 divided by negative 24. There's your solution. So that was a combo of lesson four one and four three together. Okay, I'm gonna let you try. DOL number two. If cosecant is negative 13 over five and cosine is less than zero, what is the value of tangent? All right, number three. It says if y equals three tangent of two thirds x plus pi, what values of x would the function be undefined in the interval zero to two pi? And I'm gonna erase this zero to two pi. So if you go to submit this later, you won't see this in the interval zero to two pi. I'm gonna delete that. I put that in, I wasn't thinking when I did that. So that'll be gone later on. Um, what values are undefined? Okay, I want you to think back. Second day of math with me, second class period. We talked about there's three things in math you're not allowed to do. Specifically that day, we focused on two of them the whole class period. What are some things in math you're not allowed to do? Divide by zero, that's one of them. Cannot divide by zero, that'll be undefined. What's another? What'd you say? It is with the log, but it has to be, a log has to be positive. That's the second rule. That was chapter three. There's one more rule. Can't divide by zero. Can't have a negative log. Uh, your log has to be positive. And there's one more. It has to do with the square root. Negative. Square root can't be negative. So on this one, uh, it's we want to know the undefined values. That means where do we break rules? So start here with what is our function? It's a tangent. What can you tell me about the tangent function? Tangent is y over x. So we can figure out where it's undefined by saying, where does x equal zero? If we can find where x equals zero, then we'll know where this function should be undefined. So go to your uh, unit circle, and we're just going to find the very first value. Because there's going to be transformations that occur. We'll take care of that in part two and three. Go to your unit circle, and I want you to find the very first location that x would equal zero, because that's where the the first time tangent would be undefined. So looking for x, you're looking for the, where's the first value you see in x of zero? Right here? Okay, so we have an x of zero right there. We have an x of zero, I'm gonna use in terms of radians, at pi over two. Okay, so we would be undefined at pi over two. Are we cool so far? What are you not allowed to do in mathematics? With division, divide by zero. So I look at where tangent would be equaling this, uh, the x value would be equaling zero because that's where tangent's undefined. Does that make sense? That's where tangent normally is undefined. With no transformations, tangent is undefined at pi over two. Set two. We assume that there are transformations, and this one does have them. We now take away the transformations. You use the inside portion. Because just think visually with me for a second. Undefined looks like a vertical line. Show me a vertical line with your arm. Now, if this is line going up and down forever, shift your arm down. Let's just say you had a vertical shift straight down. Did that change your line? It still goes up and down forever. What if it shifted up? Guess what? It still goes up and down forever. What if you stretched it? It still goes up and down forever. What if you shrunk it? it still goes up and down forever. The only thing that's going to change that line is go moving left or right. So all you have to focus on are, is the inside portion. So what you do is you take the inside portion. So take two thirds X plus pi. And we know that value right there will be undefined when it equals pi over two. Now the reason I say pi over two is that's what we just got a moment ago. So two thirds 
x plus pi should be undefined when it equals pi over 2. So let's solve for x to figure out where is this actually undefined. We're going to solve for x. What would you do first to solve this equation, this algebra 1 equation that I have written up there? Subtract pi, I agree. Now, I don't have a common denominator. I don't know if you'll need one or not to do that mental math. So it's 2 thirds x equals, that's half a pi minus a whole pi. If you're not sure, get a common denominator. So it's like half a pi minus two halves of pi. What are we left with? Negative, Negative half of a pi. Okay, and then finally, last step in solving algebra is if we're getting multiplied by two thirds. The x is getting multiplied by two thirds. Well, rather than say, let's just divide by two thirds, fractions, it's easier to think of it as multiplying by two, dividing by three. What's the opposite of multiplying by two, dividing by three? Divide by two. So instead of multiplying by two, we will divide by two. Instead of dividing by three, we will multiply by three. When you look at it, these are obviously opposites because I'm multiplying by three, dividing by three. I can cancel those. I'm multiplying by two, dividing by two. I cancel those and we get our value. We will have an asymptote on x equals negative three pi's divided by four. We will have an asymptote. Now that's our first asymptote. The thing with trig functions is they repeat. They're repetitive. They repeat over and over and over again. So to find all the other ones, we have a third step. The formula for the third step is repeating asymptotes are always n pi divided by b. That was the, the formula I gave you on this day. It was less than four or five. So you take n pi and dividing by b just means do the opposite because b is supposed to be multiplying. So you do the opposite. What is the opposite of multiplying by two thirds? So we would say divide by two thirds, but that's weird. Multiplying by three, Dividing by two. So we're going to multiply by three and divide by two. That's how you find all other asymptotes. Multiplying by three, dividing by two. And this works anytime n is an integer. That's what n easy means. Anytime n is an integer, that would work. So it's three steps. One more time, recap. I changed change to y over x. We looked for where x equals 0. Why do we look for where x equals 0? Yeah, thank you, Lewis. Where, where's everybody else on that? Why did I look for where x equals 0? Because you're not allowed to divide by 0. That's where tangent would be undefined. Step 2, we took away transformations. We took the inside, set it equal to that value of pi over 2. Solve. Step 3 is you find all the periodic asymptotes, all the repeating ones. Take in pi and do the opposite of b. All right, your turn. D to well, number three. <clears throat> I want you to try this one. <clears throat> and again, I'm going to update the answer choices later. So I want you to solve it this way. D to well, number three. Let's take a look at number four. So on number four, I have, uh, I see right off the bat, I have a triangle, which means what mode should a calculator be in for number four? Degrees. Degrees. And you make sure your calculator is now in degree mode. If you want to solve this correctly, make sure you're now in degree mode. It says a helicopter is flying from downtown Dallas, to downtown Fort Worth. The distance between the two cities is 32 miles. Now we have this diagram. Let's fill in some numbers. In every triangle, how many degrees are there in a straight line? How many degrees? You're saying 180. From here to here, you should have 180. I agree with that. So if that's 180, and we have 45 on the left, 35 on the right, what angle would be supplementary with 45 and 35? Well, what is 45 plus 35? 80. So basically, it's what is 180 minus 80? And what do you get when you do that? 100. At this stage, you, you know, regardless of what they ask, what law to use to solve a triangle. 
What law will you use on this one? Why sines? We have a completed set. We have 100 degrees across from 32. Now, to actually solve the rest of this, we need to come up with one more angle. So I have 100 degrees here. Do I just take the leftover 80 in every triangle that has 180 degrees to divide by two for those two angles? That's the geometry rule. I have a parallel line here and here. And we have what's called the transversal connecting them. Anytime you have two parallels and a transversal, you can use alternate interior angles. If I have 35 sitting right here, on the alternate side of the transversal, I also would have 35. And if I have 45 on this side of a transversal, this is a second transversal right there. If I have 45 on one side of the transversal, I could put 45 on the alternating side of that transversal as well. So we want to find the question mark. So I can use law of signs. On my law of signs formula. The formula we use this time, law of signs, is right here. Here's your formula you'll be using. So the sine of 100 degrees over 32 equals the sine of 35 divided by our question mark. You can insolve that, many three, one. Or you can cross multiply and divide. So you'll have cross multiply 32 sine 35 equals cross multiply here, the question mark times sine of 100. Since those are multiplying, the last step to get the question mark isolated would be divide by sine 100. That's how you do it by hand. It's a real easy step. It's called cross multiply and divide because that's what you do. You multiply across, then you divide. Either way, you could do that and find out the distance is roughly how far is the helicopter from downtown Dallas? I don't think it's 27 miles. Oh, 19 miles if you round. Wait, did you say 18.16? 18.64? Okay, so <laughs> approximately 19 miles. I'm going to go with that. Okay, with that, I've got you with a fourth DOL. This triangle. Now, this triangle looks different. When you look at what do you notice about this triangle? It's a right triangle. Do you have to use law of sines? No. What would you say 75 is? If you put your theta right here, what would you say 75 is? X, Y, or H? X. So just so you know, you don't have to use law of sines. If you have a right angle, you could use sine Y, cos X, tangent is Y over X. The one thing on your DOL, it says you start at point A and you walk. To point B. So you walk this way. To point B. He then measures the angle A, B, C. When it says A, B, C, B is the middle letter. It means this angle here, this theta, is 20.536. Estimate the width of the river. This would be the width of the river. Not the length from B to C. This is the width of the river. That's what you're looking for right here. So I'll let you solve however you want to do so. But those are your values. Problem number five. An airplane flies east for 200 miles before turning 60 degrees south and flying for 100 miles. If a plane were to take a direct path to the first plane, what distance and direction would, the, would create the quickest path? Okay, so this is uh, the lesson 4-8 that I kind of made up for you, a uh, direction bearing. So I want you to think of a northeast-southwest system. So draw a northeast-southwest system. When you draw a northeast-southwest system, what do I put right here? That's east. What do I put at the top? Okay, down here. And west. It says it goes five. Uh, no, excuse me, 200 miles east. So draw an arrow directly to the east like this. And label that 200. 
You know what? I'm going to make it go a little bit longer so I can write with bigger numbers. Take my 200 a little bit further. Okay. <clears throat> now it says before turning 60 degrees to the south. Now, this is where you need to really pay attention. Uh, if it's turning 60 to the south, that's talking about from the direction it's previously heading. What direction was it heading? East. So this is like saying east 60 to the south. So what I'm going to do now is add a second arrow from this point. So from this point right here, tell me when I've gone about 60, point, uh, 60 degrees towards the south. Would it be like this? Is that 60 to the south? Yeah. No. So think of a new northeast southwest from this point. So you start at the east and tell me when I need, and I need to go 100, which is about half of that 200. Tell me when you think I've gone 60 degrees towards the south. Right here? Okay. So if that's 60 degrees, come back and now let's add to our chart a 60 right here. And the length is 100. <clears throat> Now, it says if another plane were to, to take a direct path to the first plane, what distance direction would create the quickest path? Like if they went exactly straight to that point, what should that airplane do? That's the question for us. Again, what shape does it look like we have here? A triangle. So we can solve it with triangles. Right now, I have two distances, but no angles. But we could find an angle. Uh, here, this northeast, or excuse me, the east-west line has a total of how many degrees? 180. If 60 of them are sitting right here, we could figure out how many are sitting on this side. How'd you get 120 so fast? 180 minus 60. Good. That is 120. If I wanted to find this distance here, I'll put it as an X. I have to find the distance and the angle. So I'll do an X and a theta. For the distance x, would I use law of sines or law of cosines? Law of cosines. Because do I have a completed set? No. So I have to complete a set. Cosines will complete this set right there. But right now, I don't have one. So using the formula chart from over here, the law of cosines is shown right here. Use this when you do not have a completed set and you want to create one. So there's my law of cosines. Because it's going to get covered up, I'm just going to copy and paste it here. And shrink it down. Okay, so <clears throat> there's only one place that 120 degrees can go. What's the only place for 120? The capital A. Since 120 degrees has to go there, that means I'm going to solve for lowercase a. That's what I'm going to find here. That's my x according to my drawing. B and C, it does not matter which one you put in which location. You'll get the same answer either way. So what do y'all want to put for B? So 200s for B, which leaves us 100s for C. Now, if you don't want to insolve this, let's just think through the formula. Right now, it would be x squared. What's the opposite of squaring something to isolate that x? Square root. And we know it has to be positive because this is a, a real life, real world problem. And so the answer must be positive. Can't go a negative distance. So a would equal the square root of all that. Uh, no, I'm sorry, x, as we are replacing it with an x. So let's type those in and see what we get. Square root. 200 squared plus 100 squared minus 2 times 200 times 100. Whoops. Cosine of 120 degrees. And again, make sure you're in degree mode. Or you could press the pi button and choose the degree symbol just to always make sure you get the right answer. That'll always work no matter what mode you're in. I'm getting 264.575. 264.575. This would be in miles. That's the distance traveled of that airplane. And now that I know the distance, 
Now that I've discovered this is 264.575, how could I find the angle that the airplane should travel on? I now can use law of sines because I have a set. So now we'll use the law of sines and say that sine of 120 degrees divided by our x, which is 264.575, should equal sine of theta divided by what angles across from theta? I mean, what side length is across from theta? 100. You can then solve this or cross multiply divide. I'll let you in solve. All right, after typing in all this, what value are you getting? 19.1, roughly. Okay, if it's 19.1, the way they would probably write the answer, if they're using a northeast-southwest system, is this angle, this 19.1, is going starting from what direction? Starting from which one? East towards the south. So they'd probably write the answer as east, 19.1 degrees South, that would be your final answers there. All right, I have a DOL for you. DOL number five. On this one, they don't give you a drawing, but it just says a boat is anchored at a point B in a river. So, if I were you, I would just draw something represent a river. And point B is just, it's anchored somewhere in the river. So just draw your B somewhere in the river. And it says there are two boat ramps on the far side of the river. So you can pick, I'll just put mine on the right side. Points A and C. Ramp A is 200, part C is 175. So I'm gonna try to make A a little bit further away from B. I don't like that. And it gives you the angle. It says, what's the approximate distance between the two boat ramps? So that'd be the distance between B and C. So I'll let you label and solve from there, but I'll give you that to help you out. Oh, whoops. Boat ramps A and C. Good call. There you go, I'll let you solve that. All right, number six it says Anthony is approaching a north-south bridge. I'm going to pause. I'm going to draw this. We have a bridge that's north and south. So this will be our bridge. Um, the black line will represent that. Let me add on. So north would be up. South would be down. Okay, that was 300 feet long across a river. So this is 300 feet long. And we have some river that's going uh, across it this way. So uh, we have some river here and here. That'll represent the river. So all this is our river here. From his current location at the end of the bridge on the other side. Okay, sorry. From his current location, wherever he is, the end of the bridge on the other side of the river. So let's just say he's somewhere over here. Then this for the bridge across this side of the river is located on a bearing of north 27 east. Okay, so we have a direction. So for a moment, I'm just going to say, here's person, this person A here, for Anthony. And he looks across and it says on a north 27 east. So from his location, let's just put him right there at the arrow. He would have his own northeast southwest system that he's looking at. Here's his north. This would be his east, south. The west would obviously be this way. Uh, if this river continued on past him like that. 
he's going to look and find out that the river is north 20, the point across the bridge is north 27 east. So this would need to be 27 degrees. So north 27 east. That's what Anthony determines that this length is, north 27 degrees east. It says the front of the bridge, okay, that would be here. That's the back of the bridge. This is the front of the bridge. Uh, on his side of the river is located on a bearing of east north seven. Oh, okay, so he's not even level with it. So Anthony's actually a little bit lower because it says east seven north. So from the east, we need to add in a whole new, let's go here. Here's his northeast southwest. Let me bring this down now. Oops, not that one. That one will change. But let me draw like this. And so here's Anthony's northeast. I don't have south on there, but Anthony's right there. So this would need to be like that. So that's the 27 degrees to get to that point. And now we're saying it's east 7 degrees north to get to the front of the bridge. So east 7 north, kind of like that. So this would be 7 degrees here. Right there, that's seven degrees. Oops, I wrote 70. Seven degrees. So we want to find out how far is Anthony from the bridge? It looks like we're looking for this distance there. That is what we're going to be searching for. Okay, so uh, here's what I know. From north to east, that's a total of 90 degrees. And it looks like I have 27 over here and seven on the outside. So these three angles together should be complementary. That means complementary that if you took 90 and you subtracted the 27 and you subtracted the seven, you should find out how many degrees are right in there. And so the angle I'm gonna get, complementary means adds a 90. When I subtract this, that those two together are 34. So 90 minus 34 is 56 degrees. 56 would go right there. That's where 56 would go. Okay, so that's a 56 degree angle. And now I notice I have a completed set because this is 300 feet. So I have a completed set. Notice I have the angle and the side across from it. So I'm looking for this distance here. So to find this distance, I need to know, if I want to use a lot of signs, I need to know that angle up here. So I'd have a complete, uh, that would be the set of itself. So I know I'm going to have law of signs. The law of signs, let me come over here, law of signs. The law of sines right here. I know I'm going to be using this formula. That's the formula we'll be using on this one. So I'll go ahead and copy this in. Yeah, let me shrink it down quite a bit. So that's the formula we'll be using. So I'm going to say that sine of my set here is 56 degrees over the 300 will equal, now I need to find this angle, which I don't have it yet. But if I come over here, I do notice I have two angles, uh, two lines that are parallel. They're both going north-south. Let me add a south on this one. And I notice this is called a transversal, a line that connects them. So what I can do is this, however many degrees are on this side of the line will be congruent with the amount of degrees on this side of the transversal because they're alternate interior angles. So what I'm trying to say is this, let me use a different color I haven't used yet, that this angle right here is congruent because of alternate interior angles to this angle right there. So what is this angle? Well, this looks like it's 90 plus seven. That angle right there would be 90 from the south to the east plus this seven more. So it'd be 90 plus seven, which is obviously 97. So that angle right here will be 97. Now, if that's 97, now I can find this one because every triangle has a total of 180 degrees. And I am working with a triangle here. If you hadn't figured that out, the two red lines plus this one gives me a triangle. So it appears to me that I would take 180 and subtract my two angles. I would subtract my 97. And then I would subtract my 56. So go with my calculator. 180. 180 minus 97 minus 56. That gives me 27 degrees. So 27 degrees is the angle that's going to go in right here. 
that's 27 degrees. I move that down, okay. And so now I can solve the rest of this. I can say sine of 27, whoops, sine of 27 over x. And we'll just insolve that to get our value. Or you could cross multiply and divide, but I'll just go ahead and insolve this. So menu three, one, it'll be the sine of 56 degrees over, let me put the degree symbol just to be safe, even though it says degree, just to be safe, that degree symbol is found in the pi button, equals the sine of 27 over our x. And again, if you want to solve this by algebra, you just cross multiply and divide. You multiply across and then divide to get x isolated. Let me uh, add the degree symbol there as well, degrees. And yes, the answer would be 164.283. So I'm gonna say approximately 164 point, I'm gonna round to the nearest 10, three feet is how far Anthony is uh, from the bridge. Now I have a DOL for you to try. Try to draw a picture and see if you can solve based off this information given here. Number seven, it says from the top of an 800 foot cliff, a hiker looks down at the river below. Her angles of depression to the near and far banks of the river are 65 degrees and 35 degrees respectively. Based on this information, how wide is the river? So let's draw ourselves uh, a little diagram. There's a cliff. So I'm gonna draw something straight up and down. There's a cliff and that cliff has to be 800 feet tall. 800, that's really ugly. Let me try that again, 800, there we go. And if you're looking down her angles of depression, that means the angles from looking down from up above. So here she is, but then she starts to look down. So tell me when you, if that, let me back up here. Let me get a dot, dash line first. Oh, I'll leave it like this. Okay, if here's the horizon, now you look down. Tell me when you think I've gone 65 degrees. Okay, and so let me take this to, out to the ground. That would be 65 degrees. And now tell me when you think I've hit 35 degrees. Okay, and so this would have to hit the ground as well. So we have a 65 degree angle. That's 65 degrees. And we also have a 35 degree angle. Somewhere down here, we have a river. And that's what we're trying to find. We want to know this distance right here, the river. So let's fill in uh, in this triangle here. In this triangle, do we know what the angle is between these two? Could we find it? Yeah, yeah it's 65 from the horizon to this first blue line. It's 35 from the horizon to this other blue line. How many degrees are in between? 30. How'd you get 30? 65 minus 35 has to equal the 30. That's right. So there we go. Over here, we would have to have a right angle. If this is 65 degrees to here, could you find this angle? You subtract from 90, what do you get? 25. And if this is 25 and this is 90, this is also alternate interior angles. So if it's 65 there, guess how many it's right here? 65. And the same thing, if this is 35, guess how many is right here? 35, and if you wanted to, this is, how many degrees are on a straight line? 180, so you could subtract from 180, or if you added those up, you'll see that's also 65, and you subtract from 180, you can get this as 115. So we have all of our angles. We have to know <clears throat> what's the width of this river right here. How could we find the width of that river? Whenever you see multiple triangles, how do you solve the problem? 
you want to find the shared side. So as I look at these triangles, I'm going to look for the shared side. I'm going to look at these two triangles here. This side is the shared side. We want to solve for that length right there. Let's solve for that first, and then we can come back and solve for the river next. Okay, so I'll put an S here for shared. On this triangle, uh, just so you don't forget your basic trick, I'm going to use the 65 degrees. Which one would be, you want your unknown on top. This is an H. This is a Y. Which one uses H over Y? Actually, I might just change it to an H instead of an S. Which trick function is H divided by Y? Cosecant. So we could say cosecant of 65 degrees, because you always use the angle on the x-axis, equals our unknown H divided by our Y of 800. This is one step to solve for the H. How do we get H isolated? Multiply it by 800. That was quicker than using law of signs if you type that in. You should have your H value. 800, make sure I'm in degree mode. CSC cosecant of 65 degrees. I'm getting 882.702. Oh, uh, 882.702. Now that I know what my H is, the other triangle I would have to use Either law of sines or cosines. Have to, because it's not a right triangle. How could we solve for the width of the river? John, would you use sines or cosines here? And the blue triangle. Solve for the width of the river. Would you use law of sines or cosines? Very good, because we have a complete set. What's our complete set? Uh, not 35, but... Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're right. That is a complete set. <laughs> I was looking at the incomplete set. You're correct. Sine 35 divided by the H. And you're 100% correct. Equals, now the incomplete set would be sine 30 over the river. And we can insolve that. That's all I'm going to do on this one. Mini 3, 1. Sine 35 degrees over the answer. So I'm going to just do control negative to get that where it says ants. So we don't have a rounded version. And sine 30 over the river. Y'all get the same value as me? Okay, I'm just going to call this 769.5. 769.5. The river is approximately, the river is approximately 769.5 feet wide. Okay, now I, I'm going to give you a multiple triangle problem. So just like me, you need to solve for the shared side and then use that shared side solve for your unknown. Here's your problem. It's shown here. I want you to find this value x and just, I don't want you to miss, to help yourself out, the angle across from the x. Could you figure out what this angle is real quick when you look at the diagram? How'd you get 24? This 46 minus 22. It's going to be 24, I agree. Sneak that 24 in there. And now from here, you can go get to work. Table number eight, it says Dan, uh, Daniel is simplifying a trigonometric expression. Find the identity he uses uh, in each step to simplify the expression. I got a little typo there. That should not be there. Uh, find the identity he uses in each step to simplify the expression. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at this original and then down one. What do you see has changed looking from here to here? Is it the numerator, the denominator? or both, the numerator. So what you wanna know is what identity do we use here from going from here to here? What identity, or if it's algebra, say algebra. 
What's changed going from tangent squared plus one to secant squared? Is that basic uh, thinking in terms of spot oil? Is that basic simplification? Did I combine like terms or did I cancel anything? It's not that. Is it Pythagorean? Yes, that's Pythagorean. So step one would be Pythagorean's the correct answer here, Pythag. Okay, now looking from step one to step two, what has changed? Numerator, denominator, or both? Just the denominator. We go one minus secant squared to a cosine squared. Did I simplify? Did, did I combine two things that are combined like terms here to get this? Did I cancel things to get this? No. What did I do? Uh, transform's a good thought, but I didn't actually transform. I got one and a squared, that's Pythagorean. Ones and th squares are Pythagorean. That's ones and squares. Anytime you do that, that's Pythagorean identity. Okay, now let's look. I went from secant squared divided by cosine squared to one over cosine to the fourth. Looks like I have a little of both occurring, but for the most part, it's the numerator. The numerator is going, it's being moved. I can tell because I originally only have two functions in the denominator. Now I have four. So notice it went from two to four, so it grew. I moved a secant squared to the denominator. What's it called when you move a secant to a denominator? Where are those formulas? Let me look more. When a secant gets moved to the denominator, it's called a reciprocal. That would be a reciprocal step. And then finally, one over cosine to the fourth power becomes secant to the fourth power. That's also reciprocal. We have two reciprocals in a row. That would be called a reciprocal as well. And that would be the answer. So now I want to let you try DOL number eight. Let you work through and see what you can come up with here. All right, example nine, simplify the expression to a single trigonometric function. So to start this, I'm gonna write down our acronym that we frequently use, spot oil, on the right here. And so as you look through this, the first thing I'd recommend you do is see if you can simplify. Specifically, can you do any basic algebra? Can we cancel opposites? I'm looking for opposites. I see there's something that's similar, but it's not an opposite. Well, it doesn't have to be an opposite. If you can combine like terms, do so. And if it's still not, these aren't exactly the like terms either. If you can, if you have something shared, do a GCF. And I actually, as I'm looking closer, I see they both have a tangent. So part of algebra or simplifying is to do a GCF if possible. So I'm gonna do a greatest common factor. So I'm gonna factor out the cosine and a tangent. Now, when I do that, my front term, my first term, if I take, divide out the cosine and the tangent, I'm only left with the secant squared. Now over here, I divide out this cosine and divide out one of the tangents, I'm still left with tangent squared. Okay, so that was a GCF there, which Alex will frequently just call algebra. Okay, so that's our first step. So now we start over and we say, okay, can I simplify? Do you see any opposites that could cancel each other out? or any like terms I could combine, or any other GCF, and I don't. So I'd move on to the next step. Now the P stands for Pythagorean. You'd ask yourself, do you have any ones or squares? Now I see some squares here. I have secant squared minus tangent squared. So I'm gonna go to my formula chart, and I'm gonna look at the Pythagorean identity. So I go to Pythagorean, and I'm looking for a secant squared and a tangent squared, and I see it's this formula. Now over here, we had secant squared minus tangent squared. So I want you to think for a moment. If I were to subtract tangent squared from both sides, now this uses a theta and not an x, but that's gonna be just fine. What would happen to my formula? Well, the tangent squared minus tangent squared would cancel out. And so you'd only have the one on the left and over on the right, I'd have secant squared minus tangent squared. So my Pythagorean identity I'm going to use here is that this value equals 1. This value is going to equal 1. 
So we'll have cosine x tangent x times 1 because of the Pythagorean identity. Now, I can just multiply anything times 1 it's itself. So this is just going to disappear. So I have a cosine times a tangent. So let's think through here. Cosine times a tangent. Can I simplify? No, nope, those don't combine. Uh, they're not opposites or anything like that. I can't cancel. So I go to Pythagorean. Do I see any more ones and squares? No. Nope. P stands for opposite denominator or conjugate. And I do not have that this time around. I don't even have a denominator, so I can't use that. T is transform. Can I transform anything to a sine or a cosine? And the answer is yes. Right now, I do have a cosine. That's great. But tangent can be transformed. So if I come over here to my identities, and I want to look at the tangents. Now, there's four different tangents you can find on this. Here's a tangent shown on the formula chart right here. There's a tangent. There's a third, there's a fourth. There's four tangents listed on this formula chart. The one I want is this one, because this is the one that has tangent in terms of sines and cosines. I'm gonna use a quotient identity here. To say that tangent is equal to sine divided by cosine. Tangent is sine divided by cosine. So that's what I did right here. And that's using a quotient identity. Now that I've done that, I can re-examine my problem. And using spot oil, I would say, can I simplify? Do I have anything that can combine together or opposites? And the answer is yes. I'm multiplying by a cosine. I'm dividing by a cosine. Those are opposites. Those will cancel each other out. And so we are left with sine x. Alex would call this algebra. We might just say that was the simplify. And so that would be my final answer. I've rewritten this as Expression is a signal trigonometric function. There it is, it's sine. Now you have a DOL, see if you can do the same with this problem.